There are four very important production issues. One is the green cane trash blanket, extremely important. Two is control traffic, again extremely important. Three is minimising tillage and four is putting a legume break into the system. Now they're, the, they're four extremely important things and if they're done properly you will certainly get a more sustainable and a more profitable sugarcane cropping system. Well, this particular paddock eight years ago we used to get plant cane and first return and between nematodes, pachymetra, soil st structure, nothing would come up. It was had that we'd have to replant, plow and plant again. Um, we decided that year to go into soybean and even the first crop of soybean because we planted it so close to the harvest was severely affected with nematodes but then we learned to spell it for about five months. Now we harvest the cane very early in the crushing to give everything a good go. It's spelled for five or six months, uh, prepared for soybean, and we're into it. Uh, this is fourth return. It'll be coming out next year, but it really is just starting to perform. It, uh, it, it's really revolu revolutionised the whole farm. We, we, you know, it's just made a different farm and a pleasure to work with. Yeah, 1.8, me 1.86 metre row spacing. Um, single row, we find very good, very easy to manage, uh, very easy to harvest, and it's the type of cane we, we really want. Thicker sticks, you know, straight, erect, erect, erect crop uh, for CCS. Um, yeah, really, soil pests, have become, I'll keep your fingers crossed, have become non-existent. We don't find any steel tipping whatsoever. Uh, Greyback were a big problem in this particular paddock. You won't find any steel tipping whatsoever in it, you know. It's just changed this whole... The, 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 the root structure has beaten any problems there are. Oh, no, these, these, this was a shocking farm. It was our best soil mine, just red loam. But uh, we just couldn't... Really, couldn't we get plan came, we'd probably get 80 tonne a hectare. First returns, you might get up to 90. That was it. Back in the plant cane again. Uh, it wasn't, well, the, nothing would stay on top of the ground. It, it'd all tip out between all the pests. But, you know, there was no, there was no health left in the soil. And, you know, really farming, it comes back to that. You have, you have to have your soil working with you. Otherwise it's too expensive to farm. You, you know, you, 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 have, you it's a partnership, you know. You look after the soil, it'll look after you. <coughs> um, now we're wrapped in the whole... It's the best thing we've ever done from, since green harvesting. But this complements green harvesting so much, it's just a logical sequence you know, to go to. You'll never get us going back to what we were before. Look at that, look at that. You can still scratch it. Look at the roots. Look, look at this. Four years of harvesting. And uh, all the roots, cane roots coming through, out to here, here. Uh, look, 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 look at them here. Oh, look at them. One of them go looking for them. But they're all cane roots. The soil's alive. But that's, that's turned into dirt for us, you know. It's our biggest asset now, yeah. You know, one of the biggest um, drawbacks that we had, and we had, we spent a lot of time to get around this one, was actually getting growers to move their row spacing out to match the wheel spacing of their equipment. They'd traditionally grown cane on 1.5 metre rows. The harvesting and haul out equipment was all on 1.8 to 1.9, and it was totally impossible to get controlled traffic in that system. Now, the problem was that, that people were concerned they would lose yield by going out to that wider row spacing. So we, we really had to stop halfway along and say, well, look, we've got to demonstrate this. And so we had a pretty big program looking at row spacing, which came and told us straight out that you could have, you'll get no difference in, in, in yields from 1.5 singles through to two metre dual rows on, eight, on 800, 800 centres, that sort of thing. So this is our a variety by row spacing trial and it's one of 
many trials we've done as part of the, the, the sugar yield decline joint venture. I suppose what we've found that over a whole range of row spacings we've virtually come to the same yield endpoint. So, so I suppose the positive of that is enables us to go to controlled traffic uh, row spacings which generally are you know over the, the standard five foot six type rows going to six foot or, or 1.8 three or wider. But what we've sort of like found amongst the configurations is um, once we put cane in dual rows if a variety has a propensity to lodge that it will always lodge first in our dual row configurations. Between a 1.8 single and say a 1.8 dual row configuration, we'll get to the same yield end point, but with the single rows we end up with fewer stalks but larger heavier stalks, whereas the dual model we end up with more stalks but each of those stalks are lighter. So uh, lighter stalks once fed through a cane harvester has the potential to have uh, increased harvest losses. And in a situation like this, this is, a, this is a two metre jewel with rows 800 apart. You know, without GPS guidance, you'd be flat out trying to work out where you should be harvesting here. Uh, you can see everything's falling down. And as the crop lodges, we start getting a, a fair, bit of, fair bit of suckering occurring. So if we start getting suckering, well, that has a, a negative effect on CCS as well. So whilst we're getting to the same yield end point, there, there are some interactions that, that are happening um, that will have an effect on, on profitability. Yeah, so this is this is a yeah, 1.8 metre dual rose with a variety Q188, which is a fairly an erect variety and stayed up reasonably well. So this is jewels again, but this is this is 205 or 1.8 metre jewels. I mean it's a variety that tends to be a bit lazy. It's a fair mess in dual rows. And another thing we've noticed that once a variety has fallen over, um, the rats and foxes tend to get into it. And you can see over here we've got rat damage. So obviously that's going to be a, a CCS negative effect as well. So this is a Q222 on the 1.8 metre singles, which we we saw before in the one, in the two metre jewels was you know flat on the ground. Whilst it's not not pretty here, it's still a lot, lot better off than where we were in the in the dual model. And all our data shows us these, we've got fewer stalks here but they're heavier as well. And we haven't grown a shabby crop here. So we've got a pretty good data set now between, essentially at this site we've got um, five row configurations. We've got a 1.5 metre single, a 1.8 metre single, a 1.8 metre dual with rows that are 500 mil apart a two metre dual rows 800 apart. All of those have been whole stalk planted with a conventional opener. And the fifth row configuration we've got is um, a 1.8 metre single, but a wide throat billet planted, which is commercially applicable. And um, we've overlaid that with, with four varieties, Q138, Q188, 205 and triple two. At the end of the day, it's, it's shown that you know, the shift to control traffic row spacings doesn't cause a yield penalty at all. So there's a lot of flexibility within the cane plant in its response to row spacing. Now we have managed to get that message across now and that's helping a lot in terms of people going to control traffic and once they get into that then they want a minimum till because they don't want to destroy their traffic lanes. And then it gets reasonably simple to direct, legume, direct plant legumes into them. The other thing, of course, that ties in with that is controlled traffic. Previously, we've had what we called uncontrolled traffic, basically, and people have driven everywhere, and uh, and so you've got heavy harvesters and haul-out equipment running over paddocks. And in the traditional system, it took a lot of tillage to get rid of that compaction before you plant the next crop. So at the end of the last return, you put in an enormous effort. Now, by using controlled traffic, and that's basically matching up your wheel spacing and your row spacing. It's as simple as that, so that your wheels go down the same, same avenues all the time. You get into controlled traffic, you don't need 
to bust up all of that soil at the end of the growing period. You just work the area where your plant's going to be growing, your cane's going to be growing. So you enter zonal tillage, basically, tilling that zone. So again, there's very big money savings there. Uh, in terms of, um, terms of fuel, but also in terms of the capacity of the tractors that you have to have. If you don't have to um, bust up uh, big areas of compaction, you don't need really high-powered tractors. So again, you get into the savings in that area. One of the negatives of taking over over this side is it's on the old five-foot row configuration. So you can see up here is, is one of the, the tractor tire marks, possibly more than likely from, from the harvest operation or harvester. And we've got you know an easy 1.2 meter meters worth of traffic zone. And you know you can virtually put your hat over the area that hasn't been run over during a harvest. So this has been the, the rationale behind adoption of controlled traffic is to constrain our, our traffic to, to here and give us you know, a 1.2 metre wide bed to be growing to be growing cane on and leaving 600 mils for, for the tyres to be trafficking on. But with one pass with a harvester and haul out we can end up with 90% of the paddock run over pretty easily on the old 1.5 metre row spacings and we get down to 30% of the paddock trafficked when we've got precision controlled traffic farming. So that's, that's the rationale behind uh, changing the system. You can see here we've got you know, nice earthworm casts and, and relatively good uh, aggregation of the soil underneath the old trash blanket, but, but all that's been negated by the, in here, by all the traffic that's gone over it. So we realise we need traffic in the system, but we need to constrain it to, a, to as small of area as possible so we can maximise the area for, for plant growth. Timeliness of operation is another one that comes in very much with control traffic. Once you get into the system where your, your inter rows are compacted, you can get onto that land a lot quicker. You don't have to, you're not preparing all that land either, you're just preparing the zonal, zonal bit. We know the coast gets a lot of rain um, and a lot of operations get held up simply through, through wet weather. Uh, Timeliness of operations are a very, very big plus that can come out of, uh, out of this farming system we're talking about. Unfortunately the situation that we've got here is we've got an old row spacing we're about to put a break crop in and so we're having to invest a, an amount of energy in just to, to do a bit of a repair phase. So what we've got behind us here is um, where we've gone through with a couple of passes with the, the rotary hoe and we've been able to incorporate all that, that green cane trash blanket into the ground and, and you think you've done a reasonable job but we've still got some some fairly big lumps of soil that, that are massive you can see the, the the rotary hose slice through there and had another slice out out the back but that soil hasn't hasn't fractured at all because it's, it is fairly compressed from the harvester traffic now have a look at the at the soil at the bottom here you can see where the where the rotary hoe blades have have been operating so the next thing to, to try and do a bit of a repair phase is to bring in something like a, 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 a subsoiling ripper. Again, at the end of the day, we'll be doing an, an amount of, of remedying the situation here. But realistically, um, if we could keep traffic off of the beds, the gro crop growing area, and just let the plant roots go through and work through the soil, would achieve a lot more than what we ever can with uh, something like a, a, a ripper. We invest an awful lot of time and energy into it. And as I'll show you over here, we probably don't do get to the depths that we think we um, have achieved and done the job that we'd like to have done either. So this is the type of energy that we need to invest into the ground to, do, to try and get rid of that compaction. I'd like to have these in a little bit deeper, but the amount of trash that's in the soil, I can't actually get it to clear the, the frame. And interestingly enough, of the 100 plus horsepower on this tractor, 30% of its energy is actually being wasted in terms of rolling resistance. That's the tractor's tyre running over soft ground. And then the, the energy 
spent in relieving that compaction of the ripper tines behind the tyre. So at the end of the day, it's a gross waste of energy to be cultivating country just to be running over it. And that's, that's the philosophy behind controlled traffic. Leaving a traffic zone where it's easy for the tractor to work, that nice hard running surface, that's where we make bitumen roads. As you can see here now, this is where the, the, the ripper has gone through. We've got uh, a much greater depth of um, loose soil than what we had previously before. We have to have our tines spaced out at a reasonable distance to make this amount of trash to flow th through the implement. But what we end up with in this situation is a bit of a sawtooth effect where we're getting you know, nice loose dirt and then compacted loose dirt, compacted. Uh, we, we have got relatively good fracturing of these sides, but again, we're still going to be left with a, a bridge of, of hard soil. So in a situation like this, we then probably have to come back in and, and cross rip. So a cross rip go, going at 90 degrees just to try and fracture up those chunks. So once I've done that big renovation, from there on, if we can use precision control traffic, uh, we will not need to invest anywhere near that amount of energy next time. I guess the other, the other thing with regard to control traffic is, uh, is GPS guidance systems. I think they're going to be a, an integral part of the new system. But growers are starting to embrace them anyway. They really, really are. Well, what we did, we ended up using the GPS Ag Auto Farm and we put the sensors down here for the steering angle, which we've bolted to the diff housing reasonably out of the way. Tells the, the GPS the angle of the wheel it knows where it's going. There's only one of them on the machine. And the valving's around here, which is one there, and there's another one under here which has got a bit of an oil leak, as you can see. <laughs> but they're the two valves that do the thing which are hosed up to the tractor through the steering. And then you've got your aerial simply bolted to the roof, and then there's a screen inside the cab. When you press go, yeah. when you go, and it steers, and when you come to the end, you press stop, and it stops steering, and you turn around. You know where your row is. More relaxed, you can look at other things that are happening on the machine, you know, you watch what the plant is doing, watch the implement that you're using, you know, keep an eye on the tractor itself, all those things Good that things. you normally are doing anyway, just got more time to look at them. On, on the full track machines, you have a pump and motor for each track, and, all, and there's a, a charge pressure that sets the speed of the track, and via a test port, all we do is bleed some oil off and that track slows down, Till it gets back on the guidance and it's very simple it's only one valve with one hose off each pump and then one back to tank and that's it and we're just basically bleeding a bit off and it steers fine you, you probably wouldn't get that two centimeter accuracy simply because the hood's so far up and harvesters rock around you know the guidance doesn't know where the tracks are all it knows is where the hood array is and but it's still fine it's plenty for harvesting yeah well, last year we sprayed with the GPS and um, the money we save from not overlapping and the time because it's a lot quicker too because um, sometimes we mark out first like you get drums and get two people on either end and try and line it up because you round up and chemicals are too dear and we don't want to be wasting them but um, yeah this last year was terrific one person can do the lot you can go all night yeah you just come out of one row and straight into the next one you're not reversing yeah no, very efficient. Yeah, even like everything we do that now, because yeah, if you work, when you work on ground, you do that with everything, mm. ripping everything. Let's, let's look then at minimum tillage or reduced tillage. And of course that's becoming exceptionally important these days uh, because of the cost of fuel has gone up enormously. And um, uh, there's been a lot of tillage done in sugarcane farming systems that's really been recreational tillage. And we're finding that we can come bring that right down to a real minimum and, uh, and not have any yield penalties.
So that's another big plus. These two discs just throw the dirt in as we're coming through. We've got a coulter disc here just to cut through any thrash double that might be left over and followed then by the ripper tine with the, um, as you can see, the, the wide wing here to rip, rip the ground at the bottom. We're getting a depth of probably well over 300, uh, 300 mil or 30 centimetres and then that's just followed by the crumble roller at the back just to give us a a uh, bit of a level ground. And that's fixed at 1.8 metre spacings. Well, this is just our zonal ripper, my basic tool for a two metre bed system with a 600 metre drill. All we do is rip, rip the stool area, what's going to be the drill area, and then we come back in preferably three to four weeks time when the clods have started to dry on top with a bed former, which consists of just discs in the interspace to throw the dirt up and a crumble roller on the top. And that's our basic, it's pretty much the whole soil operation for our system. So it cuts a lot of time down, a lot of fuel use. And running on guidance, it's all simple. This is a zonal tillage machine that myself and the workers put together. It's basically a Bonnell trash incorporator pulled to bits and set up so it does three rows at a time, one under the machine, one each side. It's all done on GPS, so um, our rows are always in the same spot every time. The scallop discs on the front here, and we've got a coulter, and then the ripper tine and with a crumble roller to follow. Break up a few of the lumps, level it out a little, keep any vegetable matter in the soil. Saves us a bit of time, doing three rows at a time, and less fuel, less soil damage. Also, we've made it so it folds up, so it makes it a bit legal for travelling up the road. The machine's been put together with Bonnell equipment that's available readily uh, second hand and also we can still buy it new. The framework was totally made but the, each item, the disc, the roller, the coulter, the ripper tine, have all, are all standard second hand machinery you can buy around the neighbourhood. You know, as you know, every time you make something if you haven't got anything to copy, you change it and have a go, then change it again. <laughs> and that's, um, this is the end result. And it probably could have more improvements. It's been a lot of cutting and shutting, just changing as we learned how we needed it to be built. We're thinking that maybe every two cycles there will be a need for some substantial renovation. Now that may not necessarily mean knocking down your beds and so forth. But it may need may mean some ripping of the of the centre of the of the bed and some surface tillage and maybe a bed shaper to reform the beds and that sort of thing. I don't I don't really think there are massive impediments there, but I I, I really think that we need to get out of our mind the zero tillage concept. You will be able to zero till at times, for sure. But um, we don't need to get fixed on zero tillage. We really need to have the flexibility to bring tillage into the system when we need to have it there. And that's doing zonal tillage. That's what I would be thinking. And I mean, it may even at times 
be necessary after a wet harvest when everything's bogged up to fully knock the system out. Um, but, you know, we've emphasised all the way through there are no recipes and there are no hard and fast rules of what we're talking about. We have those three or four basic principles, the trash blanket, the control traffic, the minimum tillage and the leg in brakes. And you work around them as well as you can. The legume break puts nitrogen into the soil, uh, fixes, fixes atmospheric nitrogen, so it's free nitrogen, which is extremely attractive now uh, when you're looking at the prices, the urea prices I think are up at about $1,300 a tonne, or they're heading that way anyway. If, if you grow a very good, a very well managed crop uh, that will produce say about eight tonnes per hectare of biomass, so that's the grain and the tops. The whole lot is eight tonne. If we've got eight tonne there, 45 to 50 per cent will, will end up as, as seed, right? You're looking at something like about 240 kilograms per hectare of N in that biomass. If you head the crop off, you'll take two thirds of that away. Okay, so you'll end up with about 80. Um, but, and we haven't actually d demonstrated this ourselves, but it's coming out of enough legume work um, that whatever you've got in the tops of a legume crop is about a third of that quantity left in the roots and rhizospheres. So that, for example, if you head a crop and you've left 80 kilograms per hectare uh, in the tops, right, you've also left approximately 80 in the soil. So you're looking at around about a, 160 going in there. And we found with pretty well all our work, providing the legume crop is reasonable, you're not looking at getting a response to nitrogen in the plant crop. And again, we haven't fine-tuned this, but it's looking very much like the, the rate of N on the first return, at least, can be also reduced. And it can probably be reduced by about a third. But that's, again, we haven't got solid data on that. In this block I grew peanuts and I zero-tilled field pea, three rows on each bed just to see if I could grow them for a start and they seemed to grow, germinate, they had uh, nitrogen nodules on, they fixed nitrogen because I inoculated them and then I've sprayed them out with Roundup and then I've been through with my um, zonal tillage machine and it's ready to plant in the next couple of days. The soil's looking good, it's not um, powdery, it's, it's crumbly. We seem to have worms and all sorts of things like that happening now. So this was peanuts also. It's only been through once about two months ago with my zonal tillage and I'm going to plant cane into that tomorrow straight up. You wouldn't know whether that's been ripped, rotated or what. Number one is make sure you get you plant good quality seed, okay? Insist on a germination test from the supplier and make sure it's good quality. Two, inoculate that seed. Must be inoculated. You will not get nitrogen fixation without it because the rhizobia that, uh, that nodulate soybeans are not native to our soils. That's number three, plant into moisture. Do not plant dry, plant into moisture. You'll get your crop up then. Uh, you'll need certainly pre-emergent herbicide sprays. You should put them on. There are a range of those that you can use, but that's essential. You'll get your crop up. Uh, then it depends on what you're growing it for then. If you're growing it for seed, you're going to have to water it. Uh, in most areas, it'll depend on, again on the wet season. Some years you won't have to, others, others you will. Um, then the next very important thing for a seed crop is insect control. Absolutely essential and that will be, that will start to raise its head from flowering onwards, basically. Up until flowering, you're likely to get some leaf chewing insects and so forth, they're not gonna cause you much problem. But from flowering onward, towards the pod sucking bugs in particular are a major problem 
and you know you may be looking at two and three sprays of insecticide to, to clean them up. Outside of that, uh, they are a relatively easy crop to grow. Once they're out of the ground, they're, they're a little bit finicky at getting them out of the ground. Once they're out of the ground, they're, they're very good and they'll grow very well. And they don't require a lot of management until you come through to that insect phase. Obviously, you water them and so forth if you need to. Okay, this is our peanut planter come soybean planter. Um, we use this for planting both both uh, crops. As you can see, it's a John Deere Maxi Merge. Uh, we plant six rows. Um, we put two rows on the bed, 1.8 metre centres. We've built an end tow for this, so it's easily traversed up the road. It's too wide to go along the road. So uh, when we get to the farm, just a matter of letting the jack down. I take this out, drop that, and leave it on the ground. Go around, hook the tractor up, come back here, and I actually just pull this pin out of here, this whole apparatus just walks walk straight back, drop it on the ground and away I go. I don't lift it up because it's just extra weight to carry, so I just drop it in the paddock where I get to and away I go. This has its own radar on. The beauty of this is it's bolted onto the machine and that just hooks up into the cab and we've got, uh, we've got the controller in the cab that tells us exactly the seed count. It's got a little um, L LCD inside the, um, inside the chute, the tube, and it will, it will read, count all the seeds dropping past it and it relays that to your, to your controller in the cab. This is the gearing for the machine. We've got a, a, a lot of variation in the gear, gearing here. On the, on the driven side here we can drop by one tooth all the way down this range. On this side we can drop by four teeth. So, and then here we have a high and low range so we can have infinite adjustment into seed, seed numbering. Um, to change, to change the gearing, it's quite a simple job of taking out one of these collars if we want to go up a range. We just drop that, slide that across, put the chain on there, and put this collar back on this side. And that's it, that's changed gears. It's quite simple to do. Driven by both, both wheels on both ends, actually. And it's got a little slip here, so if one's beating the other around corners or something, that just slips around. It's a vacuum planter, so we have a, a vacuum up here. Work on, uh, for peanuts, we work on about eight to 10 vacuum, depending on the size of the seed. The beauty of this is it's got the larger boxes. So, especially for soybeans, this will go a, a heck of a long way. Double depth we gauge wheels here, so that in soft ground, we can get a better, better flotation and a and more even travel traverse across the ground. Yep, the seed will fall down this chute here. The trench is open at that stage because you've got your disc open, two discs here turning around to open the trench. And you'll see here there's a little steel guide. That'll actually wipe the trench so that it keeps any debris out of the trench. Seed drops down. If you take that angle like that, your water injection is actually shooting straight in this way. It's a single stream coming out of here. And it will actually fall straight into the trench like that. You'll have your seed, whether it be a peanut seed or a, or a soybean seed sitting in the bottom, the shot of water will come along and water straight over the top of that so you get good inoculant dispersion over the, over the seed. And that's all you need. Then, then your press wheels come along behind, push dirt in and actually put some pressure on there to squeeze it down and get some, a good sealing of the plant. This adjustment here is to adjust your depth for your gauge wheel. So and you see a dog bone in here sort of arrangement. So when you lift that, the wheel comes up to hit it. So that's how you adjust your depth in the, in the paddock. Soybean seed needs to be a maximum of 50 mil in the ground, so um, you need a nice seed bed to get that because if you've got real lumpy soil, you won't get coverage and sealing of the, of the seed. You'll end up with seed exposed and it won't shoot because it's not got dirt all around it. You need dirt around it and sealing up. Ideally, that's why it pays to prepare the ground beforehand. Um, if it's not going to rain, I think we have to plant it and then water it anyway, so get, get the water in straight behind the seed um, to get it to strike and get it away. Once you get it struck and it's away, well, I think you've got three quarters of the job done. So we're going to use what we call a beak cloth. Uh, it's a cloth about 1.3 metres wide, uh, about 1.5 to 2 metres deep, depending on how tall your crop is. They've got uh, lengths of dowel at either side, and that's to give you a straight, firm edge. So one edge we'll place in against the 
plants in one row and the other edge we drape over plants in the adjacent row. Now the reason we do that is so when we beat the plants here, the insects that get thrown out don't get thrown into these plants, they're caught. We're sampling with a metre stick and that's narrower than the sheet and the reason it's that the sheet is wider is so we catch any insects that splay out either side when I shake. So if I'm going to shake I step back and round to these plants here and then I get down and I've got the stick about a third of the way up the plants so I bend them over and then I shake very vigorously and then I give them a little flick and pull them back away from the sheet and flick anything down into the sheet. Some leaves have come off but don't worry about the damage because in the scheme of things we're sampling only a very tiny percentage of the crop and the benefits of making the correct decision because we sample properly far outweigh any tiny amount of damage we might cause. I'm looking closely um, and we can see some a couple of veggie bugs. We can see a there was a green mirror that crept off so you count any insects that uh, are rapid flyers there's a little mirrored nymph there. We've got a green veggie bug would probably be a third instar nymph and we can tell that by the size with the uh, large number of pale spots. We've also assessed the stage of the crop. This crop is at early pod set. Uh, we've got 10 to 14 days before we get to early pod fill, so we wouldn't be worried about veggie bugs. We'll be, won't be taking action till then. There's very little activity here, uh, but that may be just at this one site. So to get a true picture of what's happening at this part of the paddock, we'd have to go and take another four samples. And to get a true idea of the whole paddock, we need to sample five to six sites across the whole paddock, taking five samples at each site. Insect identification, a lot of people new to the crop get freaked out because there are a lot of insects in the crop. Important thing to remember that the majority of them are not major pests and a lot of them are beneficial insects. They attack the bad ones. So the key thing is to start with your most important pest, know what they are, and once you've got those down pat, everything else must be a minor pest or a good insect. So then you might start on some of the key beneficial insects. Now, DPI's put out a brochure. Well, I know I wrote it. Insects, what is that? And that's got a lot of the insects there and the associated text. So the, the basics are you want to have an idea as to just what group of insects they are. Is it a cockroach or is it a green veggie bug or a yellow veggie bug? We don't want to use spraying cockroaches, for example, which are just omnivorous things and eat detritus and rubbish in the crop. But if it's a veggie bug attacking our crop you know, during late pod fill, we sure as hell want to, want to control that. So we need just that basic thing, what, what group of insects is it in? So if we say, well, it's one of the true bugs, then if it's a veggie bug, what are we looking for? And we're looking at key characteristics. So for a veggie bug, has it got a shield sort of shape? What's the overall colour pattern? Is it uniform green or is it this red banded shield bug, for example? So here we've got this distinctive red band. So off on the shape, the size and the colour and appendages are the, are the key things. So for a, a bug, dead giveaway are sucking mouth parts. So people often get mixed up between bugs and beetles. Remember, beetles bite and bugs suck. Bugs have got the sucking mouth parts. So straight away you could, you'd never confuse a veggie bug with say a cockroach uh, because you just flip it over and have a look at the sucking mouth parts and the shield shape is very distinctive. And it's really just a matter of being familiar, collect the bugs in the paddock, you're unsure, bring them back, have a look. If you're still not sure, nail down an agronomist or an advisor and match what you have in your hand with the image. Key point always Look at the size. Now often, and the photographs are bigger than they are in real life, but invariably they'll have a size there, or they should have a size, or in the text. So it'll tell you whether something's six millimetres or nine millimetres or 50 millimetres long. So always look at that, because remember, often the images to show you the detailed features are blown up, and they're much bigger on the page than they are in real life. One common question is how do we tell the difference between a, a really major, major caterpillar pest like Helicoverpa, Helis and the Lupus. And colours, I mentioned colour is a diagnostic tool, it can be useful, but sometimes some of these pests are very variable. So Helis can be anything from green to black, 
uh, and three shades of orange and, and yellow and brown. And there are different species of lupus. There are green lupus, soybean lupus, which are bright green. But you've also got some coastal lupus, mochus and other lupus, they, or the bean lupus, which is brownish. And we need to know how they differ from Healy's. So one of the giveaways, characteristic features of the number of these prolegs on the back of the looper, which are just fleshy sort of legs, and they stabilise the back of the insect. Now, Healy Caverba have got four pairs of these prolegs at the back, not excluding the, and that excludes the, what we call the bottom legs, but four to that are the ventral abdominal legs, and it's got four pairs, whereas the loopers, apart from looping, they loop very characteristically, but the dead giveaway, they've only got two, sometimes three pairs. So anything with two, maybe three pairs, is going to be a looper of some sort. If it's got four pairs, most likely a healy, unless it's got the characteristic spots and marks of the cluster caterpillar. Cluster caterpillar also has four pairs. But straight away you can tell the difference between the loopers and the other two. And the cluster caterpillars has those half moon markings that healies do not have. So in that case, the colour, those pattern colour patterns are very extremely diagnostic. And of course, the green cane trash blanket uh, part of it is is quite simply. Uh, a lot of organic matter going back into the system and organic matter is good for any system it does. Organic matter in general is a very good controller of most of our diseases and so forth because with organic matter you get a very diverse biota in the soil and you get, you get predators of the, of the diseases that we have or the nematodes and so forth. So yeah, they're all the, some of the positives that you can just pick out straight away. We're just trying this right. Evan Shannon spotted the idea, I think it's down in Bundaberg, and we're just trying it because wherever we tried trash here before, of course the ground's so flat here we couldn't get the water through quick enough. They'd just waterlog the, the sugar cane and we'd lose all our fertiliser. Just hoping that being able to irrigate, you know, get the water through in 12 to 24 hours, it's going to make a big difference and still be able to keep the trash in, but I'll let you know next year if it works or not. I've used a slide of this, this pot trial quite a lot over the years. It was one that was carried out by Rob McGarry back in the, in the early 1990s where he took soil from um, long-term cane land, he took soil from a pasture, an adjacent pasture, and soil from rainforest uh, land, again that was adjacent. And he either fumigated the soil or left it untreated and then planted cane in it. And the results of that were just so glaring, it was, was very obvious that we had a massive problem. In the long-term cane land, uh, the root system uh, on the cane that was planted in that land was absolutely woeful. It wouldn't have supported anything. In the pasture land, we had a very, very good root system, and similarly in the, in the, uh, in the rainforest land. So it did say that the ultimate issue was was root diseases. That was the ultimate issue. That was the, the thing that was ultimately causing the problem. But those root diseases were prevalent. They were there because the farming system was so much out of balance. And, and you, you, you could have, as BSES had done, they'd looked at trying to identify what the pathogens were and breeding resistant varieties. Now they had some success with that, but pretty well every time that happened, uh, there was then another disease popped up and bit you anyway. And so it was, a, what they were really doing, I, I felt, was treating the symptoms and not necessarily the cause of the problem. And I think that's what we did in the joint venture, we took on the cause. So essentially what you're looking at here is a paddock that has had a one zonal till operation after peanuts and then and planted cane into it. And 
this is the soil, the tilth of the soil. There's really good porosity in the soil. You can see the old decaying roots, earthworm holes here before, like fungal hyphae as well, holding the soil together. So this is all really good aggregation that allows water to infiltrate into the soil rather than running off. Real positives of, of, of the new farming system. Being able to generate good soil health through one crop cycle and take it into the next. So, so an another one of the benefits of, of this reduced tilled situation is by not putting excessive cultivation into the soil he's been able to maintain his soil water levels so he's got ideal planting conditions here and by not cultivating we're not killing all these little fellows off in the ground as we're saving ourselves money and we're we're also looking after some of the beneficials in the system so by comparison we've got uh, a block here that's come out of uh, out of horticultural production um, yes whilst it's on on the same row spacing it's on, on six foot row spacing here you can see this with the amount of a cultivation that happened during the horty phase uh, the ground is ex extremely hard and uh, actually fairly lucky that this cane is able to germinate through such a hard 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 setting surface it's uh, in terms of actually trying to dig in physically dig this a set out of the ground it's 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 not easy work you can see here with the working that this ground's had it's massive there's no earthworm or, or porosity in that soil at all it's it's a it's become a massive structure so in terms of getting water entry into the soil it's uh, a lot slower we have to need a lot gentler rain for that to infiltrate uh, and similarly a plant trying to elongate roots through this this soil have uh, you know a, a more confined and restricted root system in comparison to where we were previously one of the one of the the real big things the joint venture did it really did turn the system on its ear and we had to do that to get anywhere and that i mean that caused a lot of problems over 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 a lot of years the fact that we did that but it was the only way you could really get to grips with what we needed to do and where we needed to go that caused it and i guess i'm very proud of that uh if if nothing else very proud of the fact that that we did that and we stuck to our guns um, under you know some pretty adverse conditions at times in the early days and um, and it's all worked out pretty well in the end I think. Mm. Great. Okay. Thanks Alan. No worries.